Three weeks ago, we at the SRB celebrated our annual conference, and I think celebration was, is not the best word for it, but I couldn't think of another one. And there we reflected a bit what happened over the last 10 years. I think we've all been getting a bit comfortable in saying it's 10 years since the financial crisis, 10 years after Lehman. Now the financial crisis for some countries, I'm seeing some people here started in 2007 and some in 2008 still thought it was the crisis of someone else. They then realized in 2010 that it was, so it was a bit a more a varying process. But during that conference, we actually tried to really touch on topics and the fundamental changes, and I will try to address some of those topics here. So casting back our minds to either 2008, 2007, when I see Andrew here, that was already in 2007, or 2009, 10, our economies were out of various reasons, in turmoil, financial industry was in, you felt it at least as a meltdown, and bailout meant that ordinary taxpayers had to pay for a crisis. They somehow had the feeling they had no part in creating it, and so were left. And I think we all need to say that we lacked at that time the tools and preparation needed to wind down systemic banks in an orderly manner. Lawmakers across the world realized the importance of effective financial regulation to, the, uh, to deal with moral hazard issues. I'll come back to moral hazard in the end. Inherent in an overly complicated, overly interconnected, overly complex banking sector. I think translating too big to fail, you always need to keep in mind, it's not just size, it's complexity, it's interconnectedness and the like. So ending this so-called too big to fail problem and the undesirable feedback loop between banks and governments went to the top of the global political agenda. It started out at the G20 level with granting the Financial Stability Board the mandate to steer this reform process. And this culminated in 2011 with a framework setting out the core elements of an effective resolution regime. And Pierre was right in reminding us in 2008 and 9, resolution was a word connected with your New Year's resolution. It was not a profession for supervisors or regulators. And I think there's one difference, I hope at least, while New Year's resolutions fade away by the latest in February, I hope that the resolution framework is here to stay. So the work of the SSB FSB has served as a blueprint for the European uh, resolution framework, which is basically, has already been cited several times today, the BRRD, Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, and the Single Resolution Mechanism Regulation, which established the Single Resolution Board at the center as the central resolution authority within the banking union, together with the national resolution authorities here in Belgium, National Bank of Belgium, and of any other participating member states, we form the mechanism, or what I always call the family. Our mission is nothing less than to ensure an orderly resolution of failing banks with minimum impact on the real economy. Let's not fool ourselves, there will always be an impact on the real economy if a big and a sizable bank is failing, but we should try to minimize it. We need to maintain financial stability and we need to ensure that the public finances of the participating member states stay whole so that it's not for taxpayers to fund the bill. In this context, I think we can say this is a paradigm shift, ensuring that all institutions under our remit are resolvable. So the work of the SRB is not so much to wait for the failure and then to deal with it. The work is in resolution planning, and I will touch on that. But even more important, I think we need to come to the conclusion, a bank can fail, a bank that does not work properly must fail. You cannot have a system where in fear of 
financial stability concerns, you preserve each and every bank. A bank, like any other business, should be able to fail and the cost of the failure to be borne by shareholders and creditors, like in any other business. So, starting point of making banks resolvable is to ensure that the banks have sufficient funds to absorb losses and to recapitalize the entity from within, so to allow for a bail-in of liabilities to generate capital, thereby replacing the need for a taxpayer-funded bailout with a bail-in financed by shareholders and creditors. Now, I think we have a lot of people that say it will never, ever work. Rest assured, it works. It has worked in the past, and it will work in the future. At EU level, the BRD introduced the minimum requirements for own funds and eligible liabilities, the famous EMREL. EMREL is the equivalent to TLEC. It should ensure that banks have sufficient loss absorbing capacity at all times, so in good times, because you can't generate them in a crisis, to enable an effective bail-in and an orderly resolution in case a bank fails. EMRAL is set by the resolution authority. It's calibrated according to the resolution strategy of each bank. And clearly it is taking assumptions because you're doing it in good times. But to wait for the crisis and then to go out to the market, I think, is not an option. So, through bail-in, the resolution framework directly also tackles moral hazard issues as it arises from a bank failure otherwise. The onus is placed on the investors who are responsible for their financial behavior. After all, as my colleague Boschan said it during our conference, should a person who stands to make a gain if the investment is a success not also be the person that suffers a loss if the bank is mismanaged? and not the average taxpayer who has not been participating. So this is the simple philosophy. I think the last years marked significant progress in this. I'm not blind. I know that we have some countries, some banks that don't have access to markets for whom issuing the needed capital, issuing the needed liabilities is a big issue, or it's close to impossible. But here we have to make progress and not to say because it's so difficult, don't start. Within the regulatory framework, we are currently seeing that the EU is in process of incorporating into the BRD a minimum statutory level of EMRAL for systemic banks. And not only is the quantity of EMRAL being looked at, but also quality. EU co-legislators already have agreed on a partial harmonization of the hierarchy of claims. It's only a partial harmonization, and there's more to come. Introducing a new class of non-preferred senior debt. And the ongoing amendments to BRD and SRMR will enhance the quality of EMRAL and introduce minimum requirements for subordinated liabilities, at the very least for the most systemic banks. Now, I don't go into where we stand on this, but let's all hope that by year end, we will have the BRD2, as it's called, being politically agreed upon so that it can be put in place. We need it urgently. So while maintaining the key principle of proportionality and risk sensitivity, and I'm more than happy to discuss about small to mid-sized banks and their special issues, it's also key not to lose ambition on our regulatory reform and not to introduce the system. On our side, the SRB, together with the NRAs, continues to make progress on implementing this framework, the current framework, widening the coverage of our resolution planning and deepening granularity. By end of this year's cycle, we will have group level emerald decisions for almost all banks under our remit. And we are, have started to determine emerald targets at individual level. Now, those that are familiar with the US terminology wonder why I'm not talking about internal emerald. Well, internal EMRA is not in the framework of the current BRD. 
there it is individual emerald. I hope this shifts next year when we have or when once we have the new law. But it's hopefully basically equivalent. In the next year cycle, we will definitely deepen this analysis. We will even more increase, but we will also deal with something else. I'm always saying Emerald is a conditio sine qua non for banks to be resolvable, but it's not sufficient by itself. Banks need to address the impediments to resolvability, ranging from data availability, access to FMIs in case of a crisis, to organizational complexity and, in some cases, legal form and how to change it in case of a bail-in. In this context, I think it's of utmost importance to note that the SRB and our national colleagues, we together, can address these impediments and be assured we do. But it is for the banks themselves that need to remove them, that need to come up with a plan how to deal with them. And they need to set up the relevant projects, find adequate solutions. All banks know by now the direction of travel, and they are well advised to move and prepare for EMRAL as well as for enhancing their IT systems, to use one very practical example, and interoperational continuity in general. And they are doing so, some faster, some slower, but I'm always saying you need to make hay as long as the sun is shining. If you wait for the crisis, it will be too late. Let me just shift to another topic, single resolution fund. I listened to the previous panel. It's too small. It's perhaps not sufficient, but I would say it's like, I would put it slightly different. The SRB B expects the fund to go to just short of 33 billion in 2019, and it will be built up until 23, when it will hopefully then represent at least 1% of the euro area's covered deposits. Is this enough? I think when it was designed, it was designed with two ideas. The one was it was clearly designed with a view that you need to recapitalize the bank, if need be, with the help of the fund. But please keep in mind that before you can access the fund, there are strict conditions. So it means already bailing in quite an amount. And so I would believe it's probably sufficient for capital support in any case, but we are still working on our backstop. It will normally be sufficient for a small bank, also for liquidity support, which we can use it for. And you might not use it in one dollar or one euro for one euro liquidity. You might use it to give guarantees for some assets to be pledgeable. There are a number of ideas you can think about. But clearly, the fund was designed with a view, once you have recapitalized the bank, the bank is solvent, the bank is viable, and will have access to ordinary monetary transactions, will have access to capital markets. Now. Looking at Andrew, I would say, Andrew, we were both a bit naive when we designed this also at the FSB table because we thought Monday morning the light goes on again and the show goes on. Unfortunately, markets might take a bit of time. Even central banks need a bit of time to assess. So you need to bridge liquidity. But please always keep in mind, and I was a bit nervous at the previous panel, we are talking here about liquidity for a bank that has been resolved. So the bank is definitely in better shape than on Friday because losses have been addressed. Capital has been restored. Unfortunately, both actions together don't mean that the bank has a single dollar or euro of unencumbered assets more. So there is no more collateral then on Friday, and my assumption is like on capital, it will be gone on Friday. And therefore, we need to find ideas, and this is what also Benoit talked about beforehand, what we need to address, how to best address the 
liquidity, the short-term liquidity needs until markets can resume their role again. Now, this could take forever, but I'm mindful of time, so I will move on. The missing parts of our framework here are actually, for the time being, definitely the common backstop to the SRF. I'm always reminding people that in 2013, ministers agreed that there will be a backstop. Now, they talked about a backstop that should be active in 2024. And please keep in mind, for the moment, we have loan facility agreements that at least top up the fund. Hopefully, we'll never need it. But we are currently discussing the term sheet for the backstop. And I'm an optimist by nature, so I hope we'll get the backstop by end of this year. In this context, it needs to be kept in mind that the provision of the backstop is just what it says. It's a backstop and a borrowing facility for the single resolution board. Not more, not less. It's definitely not a second guessing, second resolution decision where then member states scratch their head and say, well, in this case, yes, in that case, no. So we are still working on this. It should be a last resort measure for the SRB in case a resolution decision can only be implemented with the use of the fund and the backstop. And we all need to be, need to be clear, we need to repay the backstop. It's fiscally neutral. It has to be repaid by levies to the industry. I could carry on now with the argument of saying, again, funding, how to solve it, what can we do, what can't we do. I think I've touched on that. But I think we should also put on the agenda a topic which is not on a high priority list, at least for the moment. Resolution is a dedicated insolvency procedure. Nothing else. It's not resurrection. It's a dedicated insolvency procedure. Fast, with very broad authorities to the uh, broad uh, powers to the authorities. But you always have to compare it to the no creditor worse off than in insolvency. This, in Europe, means you compare it to 19. That's not correct. Some countries have more than one system. More than 19 insolvency regimes, and to implement a resolution decision has to be done under national law. So for Belgium, it would be Pierre and the team that have to introduce it, and they have to do it according to their corporate law, according to their administrative law, and the like. So at least harmonizing the insolvency regimes and not to be overly ambitious, harmonizing it for banks would be a big achievement because then at least the no creditor worth off would give you the same answer in any member state. And last but not least, not for Brussels, but for member states to take efforts to enhance the existing insolvency procedures can't harm. In some countries, it takes ages to size collateral. It might be very difficult to move forward. So some efficiency gains could help. Let me now go a bit trying to come to my conclusions. I'm not talking about all the other agenda points. Of course, I'm in favor of an ADIS. Of course, I see also the current obstacles to this. But without ADIS, we will not get overcome the home host concerns, because clearly, as long as deposit guarantee systems are national, we will always be in a position that member states see their purse at risk if something goes wrong, because it's national to safeguard depositors. But give me a chance to, at one point, I think Martin Helwig now uh, talked about the FDIC and the FDIC's reaction during the financial, uh, during the savings and loan crisis. Of course, if you take longer to unwind NPLs, you might hopefully have a better result, though from a pure economist point of view and a former CFO, the first loss 
is always the, the smallest. The longer you wait, the more expensive things get. But let me also be clear, I think when you talk to FDIC or you talk, when you talk to Martin Greenberg, he would tell you never ever again. The savings and loan crisis made them end with more than 5,000 employees that had to unwind a still fairly monoline NPL portfolio. Since then, the FDIC has moved to something which I would also strongly encourage for Europe to say, if a bank fails, you use what they call purchase and assumption transaction, meaning you try to find a buyer for the vital co core of the business. And keep in mind, we are only talking about small and maximum mid-sized banks there. And the rest, you shut out the light and it goes into insolvency. That avoids you to end with a giant AMC and then having more than just 150 billion in losses at the end because you had to pay your stuff in between too. But even more so in Europe, when you would look at, you had this nice phrase on, and if you were for institution building, a giant idea for employing even more people here. If you were to go for an AMC, you have to consider that you're talking about assets that go from Finland to Sicily or Greece to Portugal, trying to cover it, that can be real estate, that can be this, that can be that. So you're ending on a very big hosh posh. I'm not sure that this is something I would hope for anyone to have to manage. So let me just put a bit of grain of salt into your speech. But again, to go back and to finish here, I think the new resolution regime from which I hope it is here to stay represents nothing less than a real paradigm shift. And I think with our tools, like bail-in, like Emerald, still to be built up, it will no longer fall on taxpayers to pay for mistakes in the banking sector. And with, there is still, of course, a lot of work to be done. We started with something where probably only those that wrote the laws believe that resolution plans are readily there. Emerald fell off heaven. It was all there, and we are done. But nevertheless, it is a journey, and there is still quite some things to be done for the banks and for us. And I think I'm now looking forward to the other discussions. Thank you, Elk, uh, for this presentation. Matthias is now going to uh, take up the floor. So Matthias uh, was an old colleague of mine. He's professor at ULB. Uh, he was our representative uh, at the SSM, so he's got this unique combination of uh, being a, a great uh, academic uh, professor, but also having the day-to-day -day exp experience of uh, you know, sitting around with people at European level discussing supervision. Now today is going to talk about uh, resolution, but I guess there is certainly a link between, between those two. So Matthias, uh, thank you very much for being here. Well, uh, thank you very much, Pierre, for this excessively nice introduction. Uh, I will talk indeed about uh, bank resolution and bail-in. Um, maybe uh, some uh, context uh, about uh, why banks are special. We know the fragility linked to maturity transformation, uh, the inability of most bank creditors, depositors to exercise usual discipline on their borrower. So uh, these things uh, imply potential financial instability. Uh, you address that by trying to protect deposits, which deposits will come back to that. Uh, and then you try and address moral hazard through capital ratios and credible resolution. Uh, we know it's easier said than done. Uh, but one thing we should keep in mind from these, uh, this fragility is that uh, a general rule should be that uh, when you do resolution, you should concentrate the pain on investors whose funds are stuck in the bank. Because, you know, when there is uh, uh, a bear market in, in the stock exchange, it's okay. It doesn't affect directly uh, the, the companies because it's a secondary market. The problem when people take out their money of the bank, that hurts a lot more. 
Uh, so you want to keep in mind that uh, bank runs can be extremely bad for financial stability and therefore for taxpayers. Uh, so uh, also, moreover, uh, of course, banks tend to be in trouble all at the same time very often, so we should think in systemic terms. Uh, the crisis uh, was fed by under-regulation. Of course, a big thing was uh, the failure of Lehman. So at some level, let's call it disorderly bail-in. I think that's what it was. Uh, for the first time, we decided that creditors should take losses, which was quite an exception. Uh, that led to uh, an equilibrium shift, huh? so bank runs a la Diamond Dipvig, but for, for wholesale funding, as was said uh, in the, the previous panel. And so the view was no more Lehman's, instead massive bailouts. Not because the view was it's the first best thing to do, but it was kind of less bad than, than Lehman, and re-regulation that we, we know about. Re-regulation that makes sense, uh, but let's face it, a lot of the new approaches on liquidity and so on, uh, macroprudential, are still largely untested. There is a debate that continues on somehow a traditional question, which is uh, solvency, with the famous Admati Helvig book, versus uh, other that's saying, look, you know, the transition is complicated, uh, lending to the real economy, blah, blah, blah. Currently, it's the winning argument. I think we are not towards uh, uh, more capital or more tier one capital. Uh, but uh, so, on the other hand, there is this debate on uh, bail-in uh, rather than bail-out. And uh, what should we uh, think about that? Um, at some level, Let's start by the idea that uh, it's a bit of a paradox because Basel III was about quality of capital. Not just quantity, but also quality of capital. Only equity uh, matters, in a sense. Uh, but uh, given that we are worried about, uh, about bailouts, and rightly so, because Basel III is not that high. By the way, Basel IV does not exist. Uh, let's call uh, Basel III, the, the new Basel III, Basel 2.8. It's been uh, weakened, in fact, by, in comparison to, to three years ago. Uh, but uh, so indeed, uh, we haven't enough, but we've reached the maximum we could do in Basel. So let's uh, think about another idea, which is, uh, which is indeed uh, extending the set of claims that uh, should absorb losses, which I think uh, makes sense, but let's keep in mind why we had the Basel III uh, at the beginning. Uh, the big question is, will that lead to financial stability, instability or not? And there have been two, uh, two initiatives uh, at the world level, TLAC, and uh, here in Europe, BRD and, and MREL. Now, I would think that TLAC, in a nutshell, I think it's pretty good. Um, and in a sense, it's not that new, uh, since Basel III was not the, that demanding after all on tier one capital. Keep in mind the leverage ratio, 3, 3.5, huh? so it's not that great. Why not strengthen tier two and tier three? So let's go back to the original Basel idea, but a bit outside the Basel committee. Um, it's a reasonably modest idea. It applies only to GSIPs, so eight or nine banks in the euro area. Uh, it has a significant transition. Uh, it does not add an explicit no bailout clause uh, in the US. The Congress can always allow uh, bailout in a systemic crisis. So it keeps some kind of constructive ambiguity. And it's broadly rigorous because I think the, the, the most important thing is that uh, basically for uh, this kind of loss absorbency to make any sense at all, it has to be junior. To, to the rest, uh, because otherwise, uh, if it's pari passu with other things that are not bailinable, I think it's, uh, it's, it is a joke, and it will not be appreciated by the public. Uh, so there's still a bit of 3.5% uh, uh, could be, uh, could be uh, uh, not subordinated. I think that's not a good idea, but okay. Uh, by the way, it's also less ambitious than uh, than uh, BRD because it's only 6.75%, I think, of uh, uh, non-risk weighted uh, assets, while BRD has 8%. Now, BRD, to give you some, and many people, of course, know a lot about this, and some know much more than me about this, but uh, 
In a nutshell, so the key idea, that's the paradigm shift uh, that Elke mentioned, is uh, before we even start talking about uh, public money, we need to find 8% non-risk weighted asset bail-in, even under systemic stress. By the way, this is on the website of the Commission, frequently asked questions about BRD, so this is all, uh, this is the, not a matter of interpretation. And the idea was, you know, we are under this rule. Uh, you may not, not, not know about it, but we have been under this rule since January 1st, 2016. Um, and this is a necessary condition for access to common resolution fund or even national public money. And this, by the way, the 8% should be uh, computed at the point of failure. So, well, possibly a lot of... Uh, Things don't count anymore. I don't know how, by the way, the, uh, the uh, inflation of the value of uh, assets could take place, the, the whole non-performing loan thing. I mean, will that be deducted from uh, the point at which you start finding the 8%? I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, now, of course, this will not apply to secured liabilities and uh, also exempted from bail-in explicitly are very short-term interbank debt up to seven days. Uh, beyond that, you will need to go with the usual creditor hierarchy. You first wipe out equity, then junior debt. Then, and that's an innovation of BRD, uh, they have decided that uh, natural person and SMEs become, have a priority over the rest. So. Basically, retail deposits uh, have a priority over the wholesale deposits that we now know run in the time of crisis. So, um, and by the way, within those, uh, within the retail deposits, priority for the deposit insurance fund. So there is a clear desire by BRD to protect the insurer. At some level, you could think from an economic point of view, it's a strange idea that the key is to protect the insurer, but that's what they do. Um, by the way, that I think is a point which is too rarely mentioned when we talk about ADIS and the need for ADIS and so on. We've made sure that uh, this, uh, these deposit insurance funds are super, super protected. Huh? But uh, except for uh, collateralized debt, uh, they are on top. And, uh, and Elke said it, uh, while all of this was decided, uh, there was no hard definition of MREL, so the uh, bail-inable securities, uh, minimum requirement of uh, eligible funds, eligible liabilities, uh, that, um, uh, that, have to, uh, uh, that banks have to hold. And uh, it was, this task was given to the single resolution board, which has worked quite hard for the last three years about these things. But indeed, these are complicated things, and we are not yet at a point where we have uh, uh, very hard uh, targets uh, for all the 6,000 banks that we have in Europe, because TLAC applies to uh, eight banks or nine banks in Europe, and uh, BRD applies to all the banks, huh? ever closer union. You know, we, we want Europe to deal with everything. Um, now, how would, uh, would it work? And uh, I'm taking a, a balance sheet of a bank, uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, it's not a, a real bank, but think of, uh, you know, Pierre suggested, you know, a, a caja in, uh, in Spain, for example. So uh, that would have a capital of 3.5%, some junior liabilities of 1.5, for example. Uh, and then you keep going up. Bailinable senior liabilities at 30%, retail deposits 40% that are senior to that, and then secured and very short-term liabilities of 25. Um, now, how would that work if, uh, so this would be the balance sheet at the point uh, uh, of resolution. Uh, already cleaning up the balance sheet, and so the fact that it remains 3.5% of capital may be maybe a bit optimistic, given that the leverage ratio is 3%. Huh? So this is non-risk weighted. Uh, but the point is, if you have 1.5 of junior liabilities, and for example, there is a systemic crisis, and you may want to entertain the idea of using national public money, well, uh, you still need to find uh, 
you still need to find another three. So, so that 3.5 plus 1.5 plus 3 equals 8. And uh, you have to uh, use uh, insolvency law, and therefore you need a haircut of 10% of the 30 uh, bailable senior liabilities to get your, uh, your three. Uh, so basically, you know, you're, you're spreading the pain. Now, I think, uh, I think uh, before the crisis, the, uh, the UK uh, deposit insurance uh, had this suboptimal feature that you would reimburse something like 90% of every, uh, every uh, insured uh, deposit, uh, so that you're basically imposing a risk of 10% on, uh, on uh, all these depositors. Of course, they, of course they ran, and maybe, especially if the TV was, had a camera in front of the bank. But so the thing that you should do is indeed concentrate the pain, not spread it. And right now, uh, for all these banks that don't have the 8% junior liabilities, this problem is very real. And uh, the, uh, the only way to avoid uh, a bank run, I think, especially with volatile wholesale deposits, would be to have eight of junior long-term liabilities. Uh, I'm not at all against bail-in, but I think bail-in badly done is quite dangerous for financial stability and therefore for the taxpayer. We, there is a lot of evidence that well done, a bailout can uh, be not that costly, uh, but uh, what is really costly for, in financial crisis is the fact that, uh, that growth collapses and financial stability is a great way to have collapsed growth. So, uh, as I say, uh, uh, good idea to uh, avoid bailouts, but don't make it, uh, don't uh, turn that into uh, even costlier financial uh, instability. And by the way, I think, and Elke mentioned it, uh, we may be close, how close, I don't know, but we may be close to uh, having 8% junior uh, Billionable funds for systemic banks, and I understand that systemic banks is at least a hundred billion of balance sheet. Now, I think it's a good idea. I definitely don't think it's enough. Uh, I think a 50 billion bank, or a 30 billion bank, or a 20 billion bank can, in fact, uh, create a systemic crisis. Not because of mechanical contagion; indeed, uh, the direct connections are will be limited, but because of informational contagion. If all of a sudden, uh, in Southern Europe, we resolve the bank and uh, some depositors are hurt, people might think, well, was that bank really bad? Or is it that I've underestimated the non-performing loan problem? To take a not completely unrealistic <laughs> example. Uh, if you have some doubt, why well, you run, if you can. So uh, that's why what we need to do is money stuck in the bank. <laughs> Um, now, several member states have been aware of the problem and have tried to, uh, to uh, find solution. My favorite is the German uh, idea of making senior bank bonds junior retroactively. Now, you need politically, of course, to, to get this through, but it worked. Now, uh, Italy has done something a bit similar, and France has done it in... Uh, more progressive way, and this has been incorporated indeed, as Elke said, as this new uh, category of securities, non-preferred seniors. I think it's a good idea. The question is, how fast do we need to have it? Uh, because, uh, you know, we are in a somewhat volatile environment, and uh, as long as there is no crisis, of course, it's no problem. But uh, when there is a crisis, uh, then it may be painful. So. We've been with this 8% rule for almost three years now. Uh, and we, for some reason, the politicians have not been able to agree on uh, a consistent system. Uh, and we are not there yet. Uh, I think the question is, if we are worried, like me, about what would happen if there is a crisis coming and we are not ready, one way is to say, okay, since the principle should be that we need to have X, per, X percent of bail-in before bail-out, uh, that should require X percent of long-term junior claims to absorb bail-in and reassure senior claim holders. 
You can play with that by saying that maybe 8% can, can be revised downward to something less uh, ambitious. Remember that for the global CFEs, it's only 6.5%, but okay. Um, that doesn't seem to be politically feasible. The other idea would be to say at least lower the 8% when we are talking about national money, if the national governments are, want to do it, seems complicated. Uh, BRD holiday to clean up the weak banks uh, and to be more in the kind of the, the TLAC sequence seems complicated. So what has happened uh, is that basically we haven't uh, bailed in uh, uh, non-junior claims uh, until, uh, until now. And 2017 was not a great year because we have the, uh, the use of the precautionary recap loophole for Montepaschi. And then we use the, uh, uh, the national bankruptcy loophole for the two Venetian banks, which at least uh, uh, were closed, but uh, public money was used in both cases. Um, but I think it was much better if we are not ready not to implement the 8% rule. So I'm all for the paradigm shift, but you know, when it doesn't lead to a catastrophe. So, um, as I say, the current negotiation uh, go in the right direction, but I don't think uh, enough, especially for um, banks that are below uh, 100 uh, billion balance sheet. Um, I think that right now we still are, even though there is progress, uh, we still have this challenge of uh, when bailout is out and bail-in is not in, denial is the only option left. That was clearly the three Italian banks uh, last year. Uh, we should keep in mind that this procrastination, of course, is very costly for growth because, uh, as we know, if uh, the, this prevents a cleanup of the NPL, Problem, that means that uh, banks have an incentive to refinance these bad loans rather than go for uh, more promising uh, uh, new, new borrowers. So I think there, uh, the, uh, I think it's very important to, to try and as fast as possible clean up the system in order to make, it, make the 8% rule uh, uh, credible. Uh, because if it's not done, there is a big risk that the uh, single resolution board, which works very hard on trying to improve the situation, and also the SSM will be blamed in the future by politicians because they won't hesitate. Even though it's their responsibility, they will, of course, blame the, the agencies. And uh, I think this is a much more urgent and important thing than ADIS. I'm a bit of a contrarian here. I think ADIS given the fact that we have decided to protect so much the deposit insurance funds, I think hey, this is a bit of a symbolic issue. And uh, rather than having politicians trying to uh, pretend they are uh, doing things in favor or against this thing, which is not that important, it would be better to reorient them towards uh, uh, kind of uh, having uh, within uh, two months a really good uh, BRD2. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mathias. Uh, the next presentation uh, by Jean-Charles Rocher uh, was... It's not this one. It's, one. it's not this one. But still, he's professor uh, of banking at Geneva University. He's done a lot of research uh, on uh, banking, financial stability, and so on. And he's going to talk about the NPL problem. So in a way, about this issue of transition that we have and that uh, Matthias mentioned. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a privilege being here. Many thanks to the organizers. Uh, in fact, my presentation will be of a different style because it's uh, academic work that I'm uh, actually um, uh, pro uh, going, doing with uh, uh, Marcella Lucchetta and Bruno Porreggi, and uh, it's still in progress. It's not been calibrated, but for me it was a unique opportunity to, to test the viability of our crazy academic ideas in front of policymakers. So uh, I took this opportunity, and actually I will not talk about resolution, but about restructuring. And I will ask the crazy question, is it possible to have bank restructuring without government intervention? In the non-financial sector, corporate restructuring is something that happens uh, all the, every day. Uh, in the banking sector, most of the time, banking restructuring is you know, initiated 
by uh, the government in some way or, or another. And the second question I will try to, to tackle is, is this kind of bank restructuring without government intervention, could it help solving uh, the non-performing loan problems? As you all know, non-performing loans have become a serious issue for the European banking sector. A recent EBA study found a total amount of 800 billion euros uh, as non-performing loan. That, that is uh, roughly 4% of gross loan. If you compare with the US and Japan, where this number is uh, um, about 1.5%, uh, this is really uh, bigger, much bigger. And don't believe that these problems have an impact only on Greece and Cyprus. They also uh, have an impact on other countries, Portugal and Italy. And if you look at this uh, 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 figure here, where you have uh, the non-performing loans ratio, you see uh, clearly the, um, <clears throat> uh, the usual suspect, Greece and Cyprus and Portugal and Italy. But if you think in terms of absolute numbers, even countries like France and Spain have a big amount of non-performing loans. The problem is that these uh, non-performing loans could uh, be a cause of a credit crunch. And this chart shows the evolution of uh, the bank lending to non-financial firms in blue in the European Union. And you see a big decrease. And so the now it's starting to come up again. But if you compare with the uh, uh, non-performing loans ratios, what you see is that it's uh, clearly negatively correlated. Of course, I'm not implying necessarily uh, causality here, but uh, there are many uh, uh, reasons to think that the two problems are related. So what are the po possible solutions to this uh, non-performing loans problem? Well, it's always the usual suspects, that is government intervention in some way or another. Recapitalization of a bank, government guarantees of bank liabilities, asset purchases program, and the topic of my presentation, the, the bad bank, that is a removal of a non-performing loans from a bank balance sheet. The problem is that most of the time those bad banks are created at the initiative and funded by, uh, by governments or, or public authorities. So the question, naive question I'm going to ask here, is it possible to envisage a new type of bad bank <coughs> which are these corporate structures uh, designed to rig fence the high risk, high risk assets held by a bank. And as I said, most of the time they are organized and funded by public authorities. So what we do in our uh, paper is we investigate the viability of a new type of bad bank that need no injection of public funds and no intervention of supervisors or go government in uh, any way. So is this crazy? Or do we really need governments to restructure banks? It seems that many people in this conference believe that we still need the government. But there is a tension here uh, because of the bail-in uh, new uh, uh, direction. That is, the, uh, both the BRRD and the Dodd-Frank in the US have advocated in favor of stopping sub government subsidies to the banks. So they mostly talk about resolution. I'm going to talk about restructuring, which is maybe a, a minor problem. So if you look at uh, the past, you, you can see that uh, bank restructuring, I mean, b b private b bad banks have existed, but they are quite rare. Mellon is a, is a famous example. And uh, the question is, why is it so difficult to have a private restructuring of, of banks? So if you bear with me for a second with a little bit of modeling, let me show you a very simple balance sheet of a fictitious bank where you have a legacy loan uh, and securities. So, sorry, uh, a legacy loan, size normalized to one, and a certain amount of securities, which is financed by retail deposits, equity, and uh, the, the, the rest being financed by debt, by subordinated debt. And uh, the, the question is, uh, what happened if at an intermediate date, at date one, the banker observes a signal on the quality of the legacy loan. The interpretation is essentially the, the ratio of non-performing loans. So the final payoff at date two of the, this legacy loan is the sum of the, this shock, this signal here, and the final 
a shock epsilon, so you don't know for sure if your loans will uh, default or not, but you have a presumption if you observe that this uh, signal A0 is small. And so after observing this signal, uh, the bank decides whether or not to invest one in another loan that has a return 1 plus A1 plus epsilon, where here A1 is positive, which means that there is no doubt that the uh, loan will, be, will have a positive end present va net present value. And there's a, another element here, which is that the, the risk on this new loan is negatively correlated. So it means that if you merge the two investments, if you finance the two, you basically diversify. And we, we uh, assume that you completely diversify. You eliminate risk, which is, of course, a simplification. But the idea here is that there are two reasons why you would like to invest in this new loan. is because it has a positive net present value and because it provides uh, diversi uh, diversification. So you should do that from a social perspective. Unfortunately, what you find, it's very easy to, to prove, is that if the loss absorbing capacity of the bank is, is too low, uh, then underinvestment occurs in the sense that the bankers prefer not to invest in a new loan. And this happens if and only if the value, the signal on the value of the legacy loan is low. It's a very classical phenomenon in corporate finance. Uh, the interpretation here is that underinvestment will occur every time where the bank has too many non-performing loans. And what we do now is examine how splitting the banks may eliminate the underinvestment problems. So what are the main reasons behind this underinvestment problem? Well, there are essentially two. First of all, the separate financing of the new loan is too costly. That is, the, you could envisage creating a special purpose entity to finance this new loan independently of the uh, existing bank. But we assume that uh, there is either too much uncertainty on the future prospects or that the, uh, the profitability is not so high. So in countries where, like the US, where economic prospects are, are better, the underinvestment problem does not appear so much. It's really in, in countries where growth is fragile, that, uh, and it's also there that it, it would be very important to, to finance those new projects, but bankers are reluctant to, uh, to do it. And the other second thing is that uh, the, there is a default option uh, for the bank, uh, which is very valuable because the loss absorbing capacity is too small. So if the bank is sufficiently in debt and the, 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 the too, too little capital, and if the projects are good but not so good and they are risky, then you will pass the, those projects, even though it would be socially valuable to do that. So how can you address this issue, these two issues? Well, the split can do that. But uh, as I will make clear in a moment, it's not exactly the same type of bad bank that uh, the governments are, are organizing, like what they often call asset management companies. It's something different. Uh, so the idea would be that uh, the, the good bank receives a subsidy, where it basically sells the bad assets to, to the bad bank. And uh, here you have to take into account also that the, the, the good bank is in charge of managing the insured deposits. So the failure of the bank that manages the deposits would be costly to society. But the problem is that typically the subsidy here, the, 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 the payment, the transfer payment, is, uh, is subsidized by the government. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So we want to avoid that. So the way to finance this subsidy is basically by allowing the bad bank to issue new debt. But of course, since the bad bank has a very limited loss-absorbing capacity, you need to do something. To, to release some capital. And the way you do that is basically we impose a, a haircut on uh, existing debt. So it's a different philosophy than classical, uh, than classical uh, bad banks, if you like. In a, in a classical bad bank, so I'm sorry for this, it's a bit complicated, but that let me tell you the ideas. In a classical bad banks, you basically sell the assets to a separate entity at a subsidized price. And here our proposal is to allow the bank itself, the, the, the shareholders, to decide to split 
their uh, bank in two entities and to organize a transfer between the two so that it becomes interesting for the good bank to finance new projects and without increasing the risk of default of the bad bank, or rather more precisely, without decreasing the loss absorbing capacity of the bad bank. So you want to maintain the loss absorbing capacity of the bad bank, and at the same time, you want to encourage the good bank to finance the new loans. And the only way to do that is to basically impose a haircut on the debt holders, on the legacy debt holders. Okay, so there are alternative solutions to, to this. Uh, you could create, as I said, a special purpose entity to finance uh, the, the, the new loans, but typically in, in a context where growth is fragile and there is a lot of uncertainty about future prospects, typically this would need government money. Uh, in our plan, the subsidy to the good bank is financed by a haircut on legacy debt. Another possibility we have to, would be to organize ring fencing within the bank through uh, project finance or, or covered bonds, which is something that happens, but it doesn't solve the debt overhang problem. It doesn't, it's not a solution to the problem. It, it is better for the bank in terms of solvency risk, but it does not, uh, it does not solve uh, the debt overhang problem. Another, uh, Clearly, the cocoa bonds are also an alternative. It's a way to increase the loss-absorbing capacity of a bank in, in, in trouble. But conversion of the bonds into equity is triggered by some contractible event. It's something automatic. Whereas here, we want to allow the bankers, the, the, the owners of the bank, to use their private information in a discretionary way, because adverse selection is a fundamental issue. In the absence of adverse selection, if everybody knew the, the real quality of the bad loans, then you could simply renegotiate the debt, and that would be easy. But bef because of risk of um, adverse selection, you have to give to the shareholders the initiative to initiate this uh, bad bank uh, process. And similarly, recovery and resolution plans are initiated by regulators, but they also, most of the time, involve public funds, while our plan does not necessitate any public intervention. So in terms of welfare, uh, it's a bit tricky because expo or interim, once the shareholders of the bank are allowed to uh, you know, impose a haircut on their, on their creditors, uh, conditional on uh, creating the bad bank, they will tend to use it too often. They will tend to use the possibility of creating the bad bank too often from a social welfare perspective. But of course, ex ante, if you require the bank to issue a bailable debt that is triggered when the bad bank is created and which is left to the discretion of the shareholder, presumably the the, the cost of financing will increase. I mean, in, in other words, the creditors will ask for a very high interest rate given the uncertainty about the triggering of the bad bank process. So ex ante, this will reduce shareholder value. So banks will have to accept this uh, new form of constraint on their activities. However, from an export perspective, it's clear that the new loans will benefit activity, economic activity, will benefit entrepreneurs. And the other thing is that deposits will be transferred to the safer good bank, which reduces deposit insurance costs for the government. So the net impact on welfare is likely to be positive. We're currently working on some calibrations, but we have the, the, the impression that the, the positive effect uh, uh, on new loans and on uh, deposit insurance uh, are much uh, bigger than the negative uh, impact on shareholder value. Okay, so uh, let me conclude by saying that, to, by reminding you of the main arguments, that is when a bank is burdened by non-performing loans, uh, it may reject uh, profitable loan applicants, which is detrimental to uh, the economy. Uh, splitting the bank into a bad bank and a good bank may solve this underinvestment problem. However, you need two things. You need a transfer, a price paid by the bad bank to the good bank, selling the, uh, essentially the good, the good bank is selling the assets to the bad bank. But you also need a haircut 
on the creditors, the, the legacy creditors. So it's a different pattern because in a usual bad bank, the legacy creditors, they do not, the, the, the debt is not transferred to the bad bank, is kept in the, in the good bank. So here, the, the idea would be to say that the creditors have participated in the financing of the legacy loan. So in a sense, they should be liable for the management of these loans until uh, the, the bad bank uh, is uh, completely uh, resolved. So this segregation imposes losses to debt holder, and this is anticipated ex ante. So it means the cost of uh, financing will be higher on this bailable debt. But the crucial point is that no government funding is required. So uh, Matthias may think that this is a crazy uh, bail-in solution that will be worse than, uh, than the bailout. But my, my point is that if we want to be serious about this bail-in thing, don't start to say immediately after the BRRD, oh, but you know, we are in a special situation at the moment, so we're going to once again use public money. But next time, I promise, we won't use it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We now have two discussions. Uh, I suppose that maybe uh, Thorson Beck <laughs> begins. He's professor of banking and finance at CAS Business School in London. He's also a research fellow of the Center of Economic uh, Policy Research and CES IFO. And his research is focused on uh, mainly banking and, and finance. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I guess. Uh, Unlike actually the second discussions, I see my role less as a discussion, but more like as a second tier speaker uh, who got who got assigned only 10 minutes rather than 20 minutes. Although I will uh, also refer to the uh, the three uh, presentations, the the three excellent presentation that we just heard. Um, so um, bail in versus bail out. Um, that's the main questions, and uh, the um, the arguments are strong on both sides, and of course they vary very much with the, uh, uh, with the situation. Um, if you start on the right hand side, uh, bailout, um, what we've done in 2008 effectively uh, during the global financial crisis, uh, all in mind with the, um, uh, with the depositors, with the real economy and to minimize the damage um, done by uh, the, the, after the Lehman, uh, 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 Lehman Brothers shock. Um, obviously, the main question, and that's uh, what the moral hazard comes in, is um, are we setting the wrong signal? Um, and uh, I always like to, uh, um, to, um, uh, uh, to, to cite or quote uh, Simon Johnson, who likes to quote, the, or likes to quote the, the, the case of Citibank, who gets bailed out by, uh, by the US government every, uh, every generation or so, because they, they just keep doing, taking aggressive risks over and over again. Um, on the other hand, so um, moving from after the bail out fatigue, as Matthias uh, um, uh, called it, we went to the bail and uh, push, um, uh, which um, makes a lot of sense um, because you want to, um, as uh, Elke pointed out, uh, if you benefit in the good times, uh, you want the same people also to uh, to take the losses in the bad times. So you want to align um, the uh, the the expected returns to the actual realized returns. Um, and again, you want to avoid the moral hazards um, uh, uh, that is, comes out of the, uh, the bailouts. Um, of, and, by the way, very important, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, is of course uh, we want to avoid the misallocation of resources because we know that if uh, people know they can only uh, participate in the upside of the risk taking, uh, then the uh, resources might not be allocated to, the, to their best uses. Uh, the question, of course, who will be bailed in? Um, so that's a question that uh, Matthias addressed. Um, do we want to concentrate the, the bail-in losses? Do we want to uh, spread uh, the pain? And of course, the other question is actually also credible. Uh, I mean, so uh, Jean-Charles uh, referred to this at the, at the, at the end. Uh, well, next time for sure we're going to bail in. But this one more time, maybe we shouldn't do it. Um, so that's the kind of the, the trade-off. Um, I can, you can put this into a very uh, simple uh, framework, um, which I put here, um, where you have these two objectives that are kind of behind, you could argue, the bailout and the bail-in. On the one hand, you want to minimize the external costs of a bank failure, and this, these are the ones that, uh, that Matthias pointed out. On the other hand, you want to enforce uh, discipline. Um, and of course, you have the two corner solutions, uh, bailout, uh, where you, yes, you minimize the external costs, uh, but uh, you don't enforce any, any discipline. On the other hand, uh, and Lehman Brothers, I guess, is the best uh, example, um, you just uh, liquidate a bank, um, so um, 
part, it's not directly bail-in, but uh, you could see it as one extreme form of bail-in. And of course, we've seen after Lehman Brothers uh, how that had worked out. Yes, you enforced uh, uh, discipline, but you almost brought down the, uh, the, 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 financial, the global financial system with it. Ideally, we want to be at the northeast corner, so we want to both minimize uh, external costs and we want to enforce the, uh, discipline. Now, can we actually get there? Well, maybe not, but we could think about a, uh, an approach where we kind of try to push out what I call the resolution um, possibility frontier to get as close as possible to the um, uh, to the northeast corner um, with all kind of solutions that have, have been mentioned before, uh, most prominently maybe the purchase and assumption, so the split in good bad bank bank, uh, where the good bank uh, continues to function. Um, and um, uh, you enforce discipline, at least on the, the claimants that end up in the, the bad bank. At the same time, you allow, you minimize uh, to a certain extent the, uh, the, uh, the external cost because the bank continues to, to function, deposits are accessible, um, the, the borrower-lender relationships uh, are continued, and the contagion effects are also uh, uh, reduced. And then there are all kind of other options in between uh, which uh, kind of uh, focus more on minimizing the external costs or, uh, or um, 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 trying to more enforce. Uh, the discipline. Um, and again, you can think about additional uh, options here uh, that, that you can put in, um, so that's not, a, not an exhausting um, uh, set of, uh, of options. Now, the, the main problem, and that brings us back to the title of this, uh, of this session, is of course what happens in a systemic crisis. So too big to fail or too many to fail. And there are actually two things that change. The the possibility frontier shifts inward. Certain options are simply not possible anymore. Um, I mean, to put it bluntly, if you're in a system like, let's say, the Netherlands or Belgium, if one of the big bank fails, well, you can't really, um, you do, may, might not want to merge it with the other uh, surviving uh, good bank. Um, uh, that just reduces the op options that you have. Uh, which, what is possible, the purchase assumption, which has been used extensively uh, in the in the U.S. for small and maybe mid-sized banks, for large banks you can't really use it. At the same time, of course, the preferences also shift towards the minimizing the external costs. Um, I mean, it's a bit like uh, what Jean Charles mentioned. Well, yes, um, we do we do, we do care about uh, discipline, but not right now because we are in in a very uh, deep recession. So that's definitely what we see uh, during a crisis. You have an in inward shift, not just of the possibilities, but also of the preferences uh, towards uh, uh, minimizing uh, external costs. Now, how does this? Um, um, how do you uh, match this uh, um, uh, this whole framework with what we've seen in? Uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Europe, in the, especially in the Europe's, Eurozone. Um, well, th there's an additional layer of complexity on top of it. And one thing, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment, is of course the legacy problems. And so Matthias mentioned the kind of um, uh, the problems on the liability side, so that the, the bailable liabilities haven't really built up or are in the process of being built up and partly also retroactively, which of course, so. Um, uh, certain junior uh, claims have been sold as um, perfectly safe five, six, seven years ago, and now suddenly they are declared not safe anymore. And of course, that uh, uh, especially in the case of retail investors, that of course leads to certain problems. Um, so you had the kind of the mix of a of legacy problems, especially in certain southern European countries, with the. Uh, introduction at the banking union, which kind of contradicts what we've learned from the uh, bank, banking crisis resolution literature, uh, in the sense that um, uh, you want, if you want to clean up a, a crisis as quickly as possible, you want to recognize the losses, um, distribute them, and then move on. And that hasn't happened completely in the eurozone, unlike uh, it seems in the U.S. A similar problem as in Japan, um, where yes, some of the losses have been recognized. Not all of them have been recognized, and a lot of them have not been really allocated. At the same time, a new regulatory framework came in place, which might actually have it been made it more difficult to actually uh, address the uh, uh, the problem. Of course, on top of it, you have the political issue of uh, these uh, different uh, interest groups uh, sitting in different countries and not working within one country, but working a lot of different countries. And of course, as we heard yesterday extensively, the uh, the additional. Uh, um, uh, complication externality coming from the monetary union, also the structural ones, um, where you have, for example, the ECB having two, wearing two hats, as in the case of Greece, for example, both being part of the Troika, but being a land of last resort and being also the, uh, the banking supervisor. And then finally, and it's something that we economists uh, maybe have a bit underplayed, um, there seems to be a large agreement on what is needed. And I actually was struck how 
um, many people, um, and I guess I'm the 10th or the 15th or maybe the 20th person who says that we need uh, to move to a common deposit insurance scheme and we need a backstop uh, for the um, uh, for the, uh, the, uh, the the resolution fund. Um, Matthias hasn't really spoken against it. He has just said that well, it's not as important. Um, um, but nobody has really said this is, this is wrong, uh, but we know that politically it's very difficult to actually implement, which of course brings us back to the, the first problem with the, the, the legacy uh, issues, because there is a big fear in certain countries that this, uh, the, the ADIS and the, the backstop will be used to address legacy problems. Um, but of course there's a political ele economy element in there, and we economists sometimes take politics always as exogenous, but we should also recognize there's a certain endogenous element to it in the sense that certain political, economic poli policy decisions also uh, lead to certain um, uh, political reactions which might actually make the next round of political or economic policy decisions more difficult. So if you talk about the new reality, and I see my time is up, so I, I, I ask for permission to take another three minutes, please. Um, so some of this has been already mentioned, um, and on the, um, the, the first case, of course, uh, Besh Portugal, um, uh, Matthias will be the first one to tell me this is not exactly BRRD, and it was actually pre-BRRD, but it was a bail-in. Um, and it can, you can see the, the typical problems, the national supervisor reacting too late. Actually, the problems were not in the loan book, they were in a, in a, in a different part of the, of the overall uh, Grupo Besh. Um, but there was a bail-in, um, and actually ultimately, as far as I understand, and I, again, I hear different uh, stories about this, uh, there was, um, uh, there was no, sta not, no state aid uh, actually applied. Uh, actually, part of the banking sector had to bear the costs, and the overall, there was no contagion effect to the rest of the banking system, and actually the real economy came out reasonably well. Um, similarly, actually, I don't have it here in my slide, Banco Popular, I think uh, apart um, from possible supervisory failure, I think the resolution uh, as implemented was actually done very, very well. I think that's definitely a, a big a plus for the, uh, uh, for the SRM. Um, but of course, um, the, the standoff, the Greek standoff in 2015, and one wonders whether we get to a similar situation soon in, uh, in a much bigger country, also south from here, is, um, uh, it shows us that the sovereigns and the banks are still very closely connected. Now, we heard yesterday that concentration limits, or maybe better, as Victor pointed out, um, a safe asset might help around it. But of course, there is still also other constraints, such as other in, um, uh, links between the government and the national banking systems in terms of governance failures or other influence, uh, channels of influence. And um, of course, there's also the political channel in the sense uh, if uh, certain politicians keep talking about that maybe the euro is not the ideal thing, there is a certain expectation. And uh, just to make this one point, um, it was very interesting to see, and, and not enough people have actually pointed out, the difference between the, the Greek situation in 2015 and the Puerto Rican system. Two states which effectively went bankrupt or stopped paying uh, the sovereign debt in 2015, the effect on the Puerto Rican banking system doesn't really exist, it was a very different one because it doesn't exist, because it's a US system, than uh, the Greek banking system. Um, now, 2016, we've heard it already before, um, and this brings me back to the legacy problem. Um, if you impose a new regime of bail-in without having cleaned up the legacy assets, I think that is a, a problem. But of course, to be just even-handed in terms of uh, uh, in terms of criticizing countries. Um, I found it very interesting when uh, there were these rumors about Deutsche Bank, um, I think it was last year. Um, there wasn't the, the reaction in, also in the German press, wasn't like, the German media wasn't like, okay, well, what, are, what are we gonna do with this bank? How is it gonna be resolved? It was like, no, how is the German government gonna get around BRRD to actually bail it out? Um, and that's, of course, not really exactly in the spirit of, uh, of, the, of the BRD or the new, the new regime. And, of course, the talks about Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank, that's another uh, issue along similar lines. So, legacy problems, um, and I think that's uh, basically before you start renting out the rooms in the Tower of Pisa, maybe you want to kind of take care of it as a, that is reasonably uh, a stable, uh, uh, the system. And I think that's uh, ultimately where the, um, where the main problem is. And, again, Matthias pointed out the... Um, um, the, the issue on the liability side, let me just stress again, the issue on the asset side, um, you have the problem that there are, um, as the, the graph I think by Jean-Charles showed, uh, high NPL levels, and Italy is only number three in this context, uh, that are still the, the, uh, coming from the crisis, but had, that have not been resolved before the, the, the new regime was uh, put in place. Now, Matthias had the idea of a BRRD holiday. Um, actually, Christoph Trebisch, uh, who's now at Kiel, and myself, we came up with an idea in 2013 
uh, for a European uh, resolution um, uh, agency. Um, I'm, I take Elke's uh, um, uh, skepticism about this. We actually didn't really think about a, a completely centralized version, more of a decentralized version. Um, now, this was actually uh, intended to be used in the run-up to the banking union, not um, during the banking union. Of course, this train has left the, st uh, the station, um, but of course, one can think about similar um, uh, schemes and, uh, of course, this, uh, about such an asset management company. Um, again, more more the idea of a decentralized than a centralized. Um, um, and again, this comes up in the discussion again and again. For example, the EBA has come up with a similar idea, although it was not a funded idea, unfortunately, um, uh, during the uh, last year, I think. So, um, are we there yet? My last slide. Um, uh, the chair can uh, relax. Um, so I think there's a long regulatory agenda to, uh, remaining, and I think uh, Elke has uh, mentioned this item, but then, of course, not just on the institutional side, but also on the completion of the banking union. And um, maybe the, the backstop is a, just a kind of a variation on Matthias's point. The, the backstop is maybe the more important one than the, uh, than the edits in this case. Um, however, I would also like to stress that I do not see the banking union as a sufficient condition to really move to a single market in banking. It's a necessary condition, but not a sufficient one. So as long as there is still talk about national champions, such as now of merging Commerzbank and, uh, and Deutsche Bank, um, I think we are, we are not there yet. And I think it will take a lot of time um, uh, until we, uh, we get uh, to such a Euro banking system where we really then also can disentangle um, the sovereign and the banks. So that uh, if Greece, whatever, whoever, whichever country, God be there, comes again into trouble, it's not that the depositors run to the banks because the banks are actually not Greek. They will be uh, Eurozone uh, uh, banks. So again, to quote um, Matthias, when bailout is out, and bail-in is not quite in yet, denial is the only option left. And I think we are still at a problem. And this is a problem that is still holds back the, the Eurozone, um, I would say. Um, and just to make a final um, um, uh, uh, statement, um, I, I have this impression that the regulators are quite there already, but I think the politicians are not quite there yet in terms of completing the banking union, be it due to reform fatigue or being, as we heard yesterday from Ham Haman uh, Ramboy, um, they just want to wait for the next crisis because uh, they just can't do anything outside the crisis um, in terms of uh, reforms. Thank you. Thank you. The next discussant is Alberto Pozzolo from the University of Molise. Um, again, published a lot in uh, you know, banking and finance, internationalization, interna internationalization, sorry. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me here. Um, my discussion will go through the papers uh, uh, briefly, and then I'll uh, try to give you some uh, original personal thoughts uh, on, uh, um, on the issue. So let me start uh, with uh, uh, the paper of uh, Jean-Charles Rocher. Uh, I think it's uh, a very interesting example uh, of uh, a paper in which economic theory uh, is uh, brought into the policy debate uh, and uh, it's uh, proposing some uh, uh, interesting and important uh, uh, solutions because the idea of uh, splitting uh, uh, the, a defaulting bank between a good bank and a bad bank, of course, is, uh, uh, is not new. Uh, but the twist in the paper uh, of uh, uh, proposing that the bad banks uh, gives a subsidy to the good bank uh, uh, is indeed uh, uh, something new and something that uh, might be taken into consideration uh, in uh, uh, the procedures that we are setting up uh, uh, in the future. An additional thing that uh, I found interesting uh, in uh, uh, Rocher's paper uh, is that uh, uh, there is a cost uh, for, uh, um, for the funding of, uh, of the bank, an ex-ante cost for the funding of the bank, uh, uh, but the overall uh, result, uh, even if there is this increase in costs, uh, uh, is well for improving. Uh, this is, uh, I think, extremely important in the light of the fact that uh, the industry is uh, often complaining uh, on uh, uh, the uh, increased cost of funding of many many of the new regulations that are, uh, that are being imposed, uh, uh, probably we shouldn't take that much uh, uh, into consideration this issue in light of the fact that, uh, as I was saying, it can be well for improving. Uh, coming to um, the Vatripont paper, there are many messages there. Uh, I've uh, focused my attention on two, on two issues. Uh, the first one is that uh, uh, the aversion to bailouts, of course, is, uh, is understandable, but, but we, may, uh, we should pay attention to uh, the risk of uh, uh, informational contagion uh, and essentially the risk uh, 
that uh, uh, there may be runs. Uh, this leads to two things, uh, in my view. The first one, uh, uh, the first message is that uh, we want to increase the size of junior liabilities uh, in order to make it uh, clearer uh, who is going to pay and, and reduce the probability of this, uh, uh, of this runs. Once again, uh, uh, Junior liabilities tends to be more expensive uh, for uh, funding uh, uh, than uh, the normal liabilities. It's, uh, uh, it's a standard critique uh, that uh, increasing MREL can be costly. Uh, but again, uh, if you take into consideration the cost uh, of uh, uh, a, possible, uh, a possible run, uh, uh, requiring more, more junior debt can be, uh, can be well for improving and should be taken into consideration. Uh, related to this issue is the problem uh, of uh, uh, improving clarity at the, at the European level, clarity and harmonization uh, on the structure of subordination, and in the case of uh, uh, smaller banks, possibly also on uh, uh, the level of the billing threshold uh, uh, that uh, uh, should be uh, fulfilled before bailout is, uh, is possible. I mean, BRD is neat. Uh, uh, what uh, happened in practice probably is slightly uh, less neat. Um, the Vatriponi in his presentation uh, uh, talked about loopholes in regulation. I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a while. I think it's, uh, it's a definitely a relevant issue. Um, coming to uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Kenny's presentation, uh, I think there are many issues that are interesting here. Uh, there is uh, uh, a, a, a double uh, uh, position. In a way, we have this resolution procedures that need to be tailored to bank characteristics, uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, a direction uh, that the, the SRB is taking uh, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and then uh, there is the recognition that the banking union should be completed with EDIS. Uh, we heard about the BRRD2. Uh, and that insolvency procedures should be harmonized across European countries. Uh, uh, there is one striking thing that if you think about what's happening in the United States, uh, uh, they are changing insolvency procedures in order to make uh, uh, them consistent uh, with uh, the, the resolution uh, uh, of, uh, of banks, uh, so some kind of chapter 11 for banks. Uh, uh, we are far away from that. Uh, uh, honestly, I think we're also far away from insolvency procedures uh, harmonized uh, across uh, uh, European countries. So my overall takeaway message from, uh, from the three presentations is that uh, uh, increasing the cost of bank funding is often fully justified uh, by the overall welfare improvements uh, that we can have. Uh, uh, and that better coordination at the European level is required on many issues. In this debate, uh, actually, uh, the problem of the backstop facilities came out in the last two days. Uh, I didn't find it that present uh, uh, in the um, Single Resolution Board Conference uh, uh, last month. Uh, I'm happy that it came out here in this, uh, in this couple of days because, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's crucial. Now, let me come uh, to my uh, personal thoughts. Uh, I have uh, a feeling, and I agree with, with Thorsten on this, that there is a broad consensus on what would be the optimal long-run equilibrium for recovery and resolution procedures. I mean, we are talking about some details, uh, but the broad picture seems to be seems to be there, but uh, the legacy is uh, uh, imposed to consider what can be achieved uh, in the medium to short run and compare it with what we should do if we didn't have these problems and we were in the long run. And I, I see political economy considerations uh, as uh, a strong constraint uh, to uh, achieve some of these, uh, of these goals. It is uh, fiscal backstop. Uh, Competition, to which I'll come back in a moment, harmonization of insolvency procedures, uh, I seem them a bit farther away than uh, uh, they, they, they should be. Now, if uh, new legislation is difficult to pass, at least for some months, uh, maybe some years, uh, is there something that can be done with, with actual rules? I mean, is there a direction that we should take uh, uh, within the rules that we already have? Uh, again, lies behind a question of uh, uh, whether a new crisis would restore better U-level cooperation, uh, as ha it's happened uh, after the, the, the financial crisis. Uh, uh, I don't have an answer to that, honestly. Uh, I hope someone has. Now, coming to this consideration of what can be done, uh, a first issue is uh, common funding of deposit insurance and recovery and resolution, uh, like it is in the United States, uh, would be a good thing, uh, but it seems to be not feasible, requires f mutualization, a, a fiscal backstop. Uh, but there are other things that probably could be done. Uh, even without EDIS, uh, uh, if we face, uh, say, a country-level crisis, uh, 
we may think of uh, addressing this, uh, this crisis rather differently. For example, TAP has been a, a very successful story in the United States. Uh, we might consider to allow something similar to TAP at the country level if it is unfeasible uh, at the European uh, level. Other things that uh, uh, are coming out in the debate, uh, I think, are to make it easier ex post market funding and uh, uh, to make it clear what is the process of uh, private acquisitions. We only had uh, one example uh, with, uh, uh, with Banco Popular, and some critics actually came out also uh, during the uh, single resolution board uh, um, conference. Uh, Coming to the bank level, uh, of course, mutualization and cooperation would be the best solution, but uh, in their absence, uh, uh, it is uh, probably better to reduce as much as possible the risk of bank defaults. So at the bank level, uh, uh, I think that the pendulum is uh, likely to be moving towards higher capital requirements, uh, larger amount of uh, subordinated uh, liabilities, uh, and I don't see at them at the moment uh, as uh, an exante discipline device uh, to reduce moral hazard, but simply as an export tool to reduce the risk uh, that uh, uh, we, need, uh, we need insolvency. Coordination, and uh, this is my last personal thought. Uh, so the ability to contain moral hazard and to face a potential crisis will certainly be enhanced uh, if uh, we strengthen coordination among European uh, authorities. Uh, honestly, what we have seen uh, among the financial authorities, SSM, EBA, ECB, and SRM, is uh, a high level of uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, Ignazio Andaloni stressed it uh, last month. Uh, uh, from uh, my perspective, uh, DG competition seems to be kind of an external constraint that is not uh, uh, completely playing uh, with the, all the other authorities uh, in order to uh, have uh, a commonly agreed uh, uh, solution. And this can be, of course, an issue because uh, it leaves open loop for, loopholes on one hand, but on the other hand, it can create uncertainties. And these uncertainties, of course, uh, take me back to what uh, the Vatripond was saying at the beginning, uh, that we may have uh, this uh, informational, uh, uh, informational runs. So uh, coming to the, the question of the conference, are we now better at handling the recovery and resolutions? We certainly have a better understanding of the mechanisms at play, and uh, we have a better legislation. Uh, there was essentially no legislation. Uh, uh, on this uh, 10 years ago, we have more tools. Uh, but I think we also have uh, a much stronger time consistency problem, uh, uh, because uh, it is clear what is the ex ante advantage of tying one's hands uh, in terms of reducing moral hazard. Uh, it is not uh, fully clear what is uh, the ex post uh, best uh, intervention, uh, especially in a moment in which uh, we haven't uh, yet uh, built uh, the entire machine. And this uh, comes also at the moment in which uh, the political environment seems to be definitely worse than it was a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much. We don't have much time left. Maybe uh, a very maybe short summary of what has been said. I know it's heroic to try that. My feeling is basically we, we agree that building buffers is a good idea, especially buffers of good quality. There we do agree. Um, the question is, and, and a lot of speakers mentioned the difference between a systemic crisis and an idiosyncratic crisis. Uh, so are we safe if the, the crisis is idiosyncratic? I, I guess most believe around the table we are making progress. If the crisis is systemic, is billing going to work, contagion? Is it a good, good idea that for small banks and medium-sized banks we don't foresee any MREL? And what do we do then? They will go in liquidation. Uh, that, I guess, remains an open issue. Now we've seen that there are loopholes in the BRD. Is it a case of constructive ambiguity? Uh, then it's fine. Is it a case of ambiguity uh, period? Maybe. On, on the backstop, I think we still have a lot of discussion to do. Uh, Mat Matthias mentioned that actually the 8% the, the at point of failure is extremely demanding. So actually being able to use a single resolution fund uh, is, is not at all obvious in this condition. And also that EDIS is actually a marginal line that has been built very, very far away from the front, and actually uh, the first ones that would suffer from bailing beyond the senior ones are, are most probably non-protected deposits, and, be, and EDIS is not taking care of that one. So maybe this is to relaunch the debate, and probably we only have like five minutes for uh, the debate, if, if, if possible, I'm looking at the, the next uh, panelist. Uh, so the floor is yours.
and Vitor has been extremely anxious to be able to, and he's in front of me, so sorry for yes. that, but Vitor, please. Thank you. Two questions, one for Matthias and another one for Thorsten. Um, for Matthias, I uh, enjoyed very much your, uh, your talk, and the point you made that the 8% are an exaggeration, particularly if they are to be applied in a systemic crisis. Uh, when we think that in the big crisis we had, uh, only one bank had losses above 8% of total balance sheet, and the average was 3%. Uh, uh, but the question is to you, BRRD also has a problem of uh, um, treating in an equivalent way senior bonds and the deposits that are eligible to be bailed in. They are pari passo. They, that this was never used, but it's, uh, it implies that the uh, hierarchy is not that first you bail in the shareholders, then subordinated debt, then senior bond, then eligible deposits. No. Eligible deposits are at uh, peri passo with senior bonds, which I think is a mistake. Uh, when in office I fought very hard to have uh, a proper uh, depositor preference as in the US, but it was not possible. What do you think about that? For Thorsten, um, two uh, brief comments before the question. Uh, when you say that regulators are there and politicians are not, I don't fully agree because in the case of the two Venetian banks, it was the decision by the regulator, in this case the SRB, not uh, to have a resolution of those two banks, which uh, they that could have been a different decision that then sent the two banks for national legislation. So it was not the politicians. Uh, uh, the other comment is on the Portuguese bears. You used it as a good example of uh, no bailout and bail-in. Well, be careful because bail-in was very far away from the 8%, very far away. No depositor was touched. Uh, and there were very sizable costs for the uh, taxpayer that still may increase as a result of the conditions of the privatization of the remaining bank. But the question is, you said that uh, um, uh, bail-in is good for discipline, uh, and uh, in your, which is true, but my question is, uh, how does the 8% that then includes bail-in of bondholders and depositors increase discipline. I understand the argument fully about shareholders. Yes, that's discipline. But is it uh, the same uh, just to have so generalized bail-in up to 8% of the total balance sheet? Yes, um, I agree with you, Vitor, that indeed in B the original BRD, uh, senior bonds are indeed pari passu with wholesale deposits, and uh, I think we agreed it's a, it's a mistake. <laughs> now, it is also true that, for example, in uh, Germany, they decided by law retroactively to make these senior bonds uh, junior, and uh, that's one way to go. Of course, uh, it will be good for financial stability, uh, and it seems to be it went through the legal system. Uh, now, the, uh, the, uh, as I said, Italy has done something a bit similar, but derivatives are treated uh, differently. Uh, and then France, which has now become uh, a kind of uh, a European, part of the European toolbox, these preferred senior, juniors or senior, I don't know, uh, the, which is senior non-preferred. So, which are, so, senior to junior, but junior to senior, I guess. Uh, as a way, I mean, I think there is quite an agreement that this is kind of where we should go, at least on, for systemic banks. The question is the transition and the sequencing. And then there is the question of the, the smaller banks. Uh, and by small, we still mean uh, like 99 billion uh, euros, which is not that small. So, uh, but, um, but otherwise, I think we, we agree on that. Maybe just one point on, uh, on these bailout backstops. Um, it's a bit funny in discussion that Almost everybody is against bailouts, and almost everybody is in favor of backstop. And at some level, this is the same. These are synonyms. Huh? So it's about using public money. So it's all about the design of these things. Uh, but, but I think we should go into in these specifics rather than. Uh, I think these 
these words have taken a life of their own, which at some level is very surprising. Just want to get, set the record straight. The backstop is just enhancing the single resolution fund through bluntly a loan that has to be, be, uh, be repaid. And the current f time frame for that seems to be somehow either three or five years. So it is not bailing out and then you forget about it. It is just enhancing and increasing the size of the fund and the repayment comes with ex post contributions of the industry into the fund. I agree with you. I would still argue that it's a, it's a question of design. For example, in Belgium, KBC was bailed out 7 billion and they repaid 12 billion. So, you know, this was a well done bailout held by the fact, first of all, the European Commission helped make the contract a bit tougher, help Belgium. On top of that, KBC was a solvent bank in the end, so that's okay. But my, my point is that indeed, uh, the, uh, it is a question of design. Um, of course, just to come back to the KBC, I mean, you, you haven't mentioned the signaling effect, right? I mean, you still have the, the, the signaling effect in terms of future risk taking by, by a bailout. So, um, on, the, on the questions by Victor, I actually don't see a contradiction um, on divination banks. Um, uh, yes, a decision by the regulators, but in the absence of politicians to address the legacy problems. So, it gets, that's, that's how I see it. But, okay, no, I... Um, and of course, regulators, uh, I think one thing is, the, again, the, the BRRD framework, but I think also their regulators need the flexibility to uh, adjust it to, the, to the situations. On BESH, um, I, was, um, I think I made clear that this was not according to BRRD because it was pre-BRRD, but uh, I was referring mostly uh, to research I've done with the Portuguese credit registry data that the effects on the rest of the financial system and on the real economy were rather mitigated. And there was no contagion effect. So that's it. On finally, so my, my little framework is very much a conceptual one, um, but you should see, of course, in across different bonds, different yields reflecting different risks, and that's what I mean by uh, by by market discipline. So not just equity holders, but also bond holders, as compared to uh, compared to uh, uh, to to us simple depositors uh, who get about extremely low interest rates because they are supposedly also secured and easily accessible. But then also bond holders having different interest rates according to the risk they are supposedly taking, and that should be enforced in the case of resolution. That was uh, I'm referring to. Thanks. Okay, I'm looking at Benoit. I think it's best that we stop now. I know it's very frustrating, uh, but we have then lunch maybe to discuss uh, the issues. And uh, again, thank you to the speakers, the discussions, uh, and to you all. And we'll see you next time.